difficulty, so we are starting over with bringing the zoo to you. Uh, my name is Carrie, and I am the lead animal care specialist here at Brookfield Zoo in our hooved animal section. Today I'm going to be talking to you guys about our Chevalsky horses. The Chevalsky horses were um, first discovered to the Western world in the early 1900s by uh, an explorer called General Chevalsky, and that's where they get their name. Um, this is considered to be the last true wild horse, meaning that this species of horse has never been domesticated by people. Um, they are different from domestic horses in that they um, are genetically different. They have 66 chromosomes in their DNA, whereas uh, domestic horses only have 64. Um, they also have uh, the distinctive erect mane, similar to a zebra, um, so their mane does not flop over. And they have um, a dark dorsal stripe, which is hard to tell from this angle, but they have a dark dorsal stripe that runs all the way down their back from their mane to their tail. Um, and their lower legs, um, it's not as prominent in the two females that we have here, um, but there are some um, stripes on their lower legs and that is typically indicative of like more ancient breeds of horses. Uh, the two horses that we have here with us today are Bikit, who is closer to us. She's darker. Um, she's a 19-year-old female. And then behind her is Salongo, who is a 14-year-old female. Um, this species of horse is typically found in the steppes of Asia. Um, historically, they've been found in the Gobi Desert region. Um, and so they are very well adapted to extreme temperatures. Um, it's raining here in Chicago Lambs today, and these horses, as you can see, don't mind that. They're very uh, weather hardy. They um, can withstand temperatures as low as below 40 and as high as 110 in the summertime. Um, you can see that Salongo is starting to lose her right now. Um, so they do grow a thick winter coat and then that does get shed out in the summertime and they get a very smooth short coat in the summertime. Um, these animals primarily eat grasses as they are showing off for us right now. Um, that makes up the bulk of their diet. But considering that they are from arid regions, they're also somewhat opportunistic. So they will also eat um, you know, leaves off trees and bushes and herby plants, um, you know, whatever they can find when food is scarce, but grass is their preferred food. Here at the zoo, they get a mix of um, a pelleted diet, which provides like all the vitamins and minerals that they need, um, as well as some calorie. And then they also get grass hay, which makes up the bulk of their diet. And then of course they get, um, other produce treats like carrots and apples that they really enjoy. This, uh, this species is considered to be a real conservation success story. Um, in the early 19th century, or I'm sorry, the early 1900s, there were very few animals remaining and um, 13 Chevalsky horses were taken into managed care where they were kept as a breeding population. Um, then in the late 40s, another animal was found and introduced into that herd. So all Chevalsky horses that exist today were founded from those 14 animals. So um, the population is recovering at this point. Um, in the late 1990s, the population was doing well enough that they were able to introduce those animals back into the wild. So Hustai National Park in Mongolia now holds about 300 Chevalsky horses. Um, so that's the largest population of Chevalsky horses that exists today. Um, and then in other areas in the wild, um, sort of dispersed throughout China and Mongolia and Kazakhstan, there are another 200 Chevalsky horses. So there's roughly about 500 horses now in the wild. There, um, there is still a managed population here in North America, as well as managed populations in um, Europe. So this population is managed 
locally. Um, there are about 200 animals here in the States, um, or in North America, I should say. Um, and an exciting thing that this North American population has now contributed to the success of this species is that um, they've been able to develop an artificial insemination process that has been successful for this species. So that makes it much easier for researchers to exchange genetic information between um, the, the managed population in human care and the wild population. So for a species that uh, was so bottlenecked, um, so it had like such little genetic diversity from being founded from just those 14 animals, it's really important for us to uh, maintain their genetic diversity as much as we can. Risks that are still being presented to the population in the wild is that um, they're still being hunted, um, but the bigger risk to them at this point is that they um, are at risk with contact with human domestic livestock populations. Um, Hybridization with domestic horses is a real problem for this species, as well as diseases that are introduced from those domestic horses as well. So um, researchers are working really hard to um, mitigate those, those problems. They're also at risk of um, extreme weather events. Um, so here in Chicagoland, we've been experiencing polar vortexes in the winter and um, those populations in Asia experience those same extreme weather events. Um, and those can be really hard on those populations as well. So, so that's just another limiting factor to the growth of this population. Um, really interestingly, there is a population of animals that is thriving in the former Chernobyl site. Um, and researchers believe that that is largely in part because of the fact that they're just being left alone. They're not, um, experiencing those human interventions. So that's an interesting story that researchers are watching. So can you remind us what their names are? Their names are Bakit, who is on the left right now, and Salongo, who is on the right. Bakit is much darker than Salongo, and that's one of the ways that we can tell them apart. And how old are they? Bakit is 19 years old, and Salongo is 14. Uh. So they're both considered to be middle-aged for Chevalsky horses, um, typically they can live into their mid to upper 20s in human care. Um, a more typical lifespan for animals in the wild would be about 20 years. Um, what does the P stand for? Why do we call them P horses? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, we call them P horses because it's a lot easier for us to say than Chevalsky horses. Uh, the word Chevalsky is actually um, a name. They were named after a naturalist that uh, discovered them and he was a Russian explorer and so he has a very complicated uh, spelling to his name, you know, per our standards here in the United States. So um, Chevalsky is actually spelled with a P. Now will these horses ever be released back into the wild? These particular horses will not be released into the wild. Um, these are both considered to be non-breeding females. Um, so for whatever reason in their history, they have not been able to conceive. So um, they are being managed here um, at Brookfield Zoo as a way for us to share the Chevalsky horse success story with our guests here at the zoo. Um, but they would not be good candidates to be released into the wild. How fast can they run? They are comparable to a domestic are short and stocky, um, so not as fast as like a thoroughbred or a quarter horse, but um, they can probably run 30 miles per hour. What other animals are they related to? Um, they're related to domestic horses. Um, and then also then loosely related to other equids, including uh, donkeys and zebras. Uh, does the rain bother them at all? The rain does not bother them. Um, they are perfectly happy to just stand out here in the rain and nibble on the grass. Aside from the grass that they're grazing on, what is their typical diet? 
Their typical diet here at Brookfield Zoo consists of it's a concentrated um, sort of like cereal product almost. It's very similar to cereal with people where it has added vitamins and minerals into it. Um, and then they also, the bulk of their diet is made up of grass hay. And then they also get treats like carrots and apples. How tall do they get? Four and a half feet at the shoulder, like four and a half to five feet at the shoulder. So they're not very tall. All right. Do they stay outside all winter? They actually do stay outside all winter. Um, they do have access to a heated barn if they chose to go in, but um, they very rarely do choose to go in. So they're one of the few species that um, when we have those polar vortex events, they're one of the few species that we can let stay outside and, um, you know, it's not harmful to them. They're very well adapted to those extreme temperatures. And uh, what are their favorite treats? Their favorite treats are definitely um, fresh grass like they're experiencing right now. Um, when we were getting ready to let them into this grassy yard, they got really excited. Um, we do maintain this yard as a pasture yard to offer them more natural foraging opportunities and it really is one of their favorite things. Thank you guys so much for joining us today for bringing the zoo to you. We can't wait to see you back at Brookfield Zoo soon and we truly appreciate all of your continued support.